Welcome to the Three Haunted Podcast, where we bring you all things horror, supernatural, folklore, mythology, and all things that go bump in the night. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? I'm your co-host, Kevin, K-Daddy from Dirty South, the ATL, Hotlanta, Georgia. I'm a post-production master, filmmaker, and horror nerd. And I'm your co-host, John Thomas, ghost hunter, super smartass, and film lover extraordinaire. Hey, guys, this is your co-host, Ashley, Gorilla Girl filmmaker, lunar goddess, and cinephile. What's up, ghouls, gals, and all of you horror fanatics out there? In today's show, we're going to be talking about the psychology of horror. So dive in with us as we discuss this dark, dark world with a very special guest of ours. But first, here's Ashley with a word from our podcast network. Are you looking for more awesome podcasts? Head on over to withoutyourhead.com for access to the Without Your Head podcast network, where you'll find a variety of podcasts sure to keep you entertained and coming back for more. Welcome back, MetaPals. We are pleased to introduce our special guest today, guerrilla metaphysician, bibliophile, and informed horror enthusiast, Johannes Pontes. Welcome, Johnny. Hey. Hello, hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. We're excited to have you on here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to uh, join into the conversation because uh, I really have enjoyed listening to y'all's conversations across a wide range of topics so far. It's been pretty fun. I'm really pleased to hear that someone actually listens to our show. So that's just really <laughs> exciting in that in and of itself. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, we have a listener. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got at least one. So, uh, and and for all those other listeners out there, uh, you too could one day be just like me on this podcast. <laughs> and I heard that you're going to give me a run for my money on bad jokes, which isn't that hard to do. I don't know. We'll see what kind of mood I'm in tonight. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> As you guys know, I am a big horror fanatic. I love all things horror, whether it's horror art, horror film, horror books, like literature. I just, I love it all. I soak it all in. So I was really excited that we are all going to dive into this topic of the psychology of horror. Now, when people watch horror films, read horror books, horror art, they don't tend to stop and ask themselves, why do I like this? Why am I into this? But I figure this is a good night. It's a good night for at least where I'm at. It's super rainy. It's a dark, dreary day. Like, let's do it. Let's get into this. And actually, when I was in film school, I did an essay on on horror because it's honestly, it's my favorite genre. And I feel like it's one of the most true genres uh, within cinema, television, any narrative. I just, I, I love horror. That's a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested to hear. So what was the nature of that essay? The, the gist of it was, um, I've, I've always personally felt that horror is the truest genre, like I just said. And the, where that comes from is with comedy, with drama, it's very subjective of um, like what you find funny, what you find heartwarming, what you find uh, in, engaging and whatnot. But for most people, the same interactions that can cause a fight or flight and um, terrifying react or terrified reaction is is the same. And so I, I've always felt that it was one of the more universal uh, genres as well in, in that sense. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. I like that a lot because um, I'm kind of like preparing for this and, and sort of researching um, around this, you know, one of the places that sort of immediately stuck out to me as fertile ground for investigation was the interplay between aesthetics and and, um, and psychoanalysis and, and you know how how these two things kind of are essentially like outgrowths of philosophy but it's really interesting because uh, a lot of aesthetics concerns itself with this like universality and and um, and I I find it interesting that you say that horror is kind of the truest in that way because um, a lot of my thinking around this over the past week has kind of developed into something like I think it there's something about it that maybe acts more like a lens for a generation. It is more universal, I feel like, than than many other things, um, because at the end of the day, we're just trying to stay alive. I love that you say at the end of the day, we're just trying to stay alive, because I really think that at the heart of it all, that is what makes the horror genre universal 
And that's what makes it as captivating as it is and why people continuously come back to it. Because I come from it from like the psychology of horror. I come from it more of a like neuropsychology and by almost a biological level. So for me, we're all ingrained with a survival instinct, like in our DNA, in our genetic code. It's like this idea that we've got to stay alive. And we see it not just in horror, but even in oral traditions throughout like different cultures. This idea that the stories that you hear um, that are passed down through morals, songs, everything that's a life lesson that they want people to remember and hold on to and pass down. Those are kind of horror stories. They're not Mm -hmm. really happy stories. And there's a reason for that. Because if all of our oral traditions, whether it be through storytelling media or whether we're passing it down you know story to story generation to generation we have to learn something to stay alive it's in our genetic coding to stay alive and so horror films i think speaks to that horror or i should say the horror genre speaks to that to that in a way where i almost feel like it speaks to us on a cellular level so it's not just like a thrill which is also another aspect of that but it does speak to us in a biological way that it's like oh we better pay attention because this is something that is potentially going to help me stay alive. I don't know. That's just one tangent. No, no. I, I, I think that's where I, I tend to fall um, in, in my thinking around this as well. Um, after really kind of like taking the deep dive uh, recently, because like one of the things that I, I encountered in kind of reading about um, just the philosophy of horror and like, what is this thing that, that we actually like feel there's this guy, Noel Carroll, who wrote a book called The Philosophy of Horror, which is an interesting read, and I definitely recommend it. He's the first person to take horror seriously in like an academic way, at least that I could find. His thinking around it is very reflective of a time before like we can really look at any of this stuff through the lens of evolutionary psychology. Like It's a pretty young field. We're only now just getting the kind of data tools we need to actually be able to do real science in that field. So it's really interesting because his whole analysis is contingent on this idea of like, okay, well, the characters in a horror narrative have this experience. And if you kind of look at like a sample of like written horror and uh, horror on screen, you can kind of take an analysis and say, okay, well, generally speaking, if you make an observation, there's always some element of fear or terror. And there's always some element of disgust or um, like category violation is is where he ends up going with this, some element of like impurity. But basically he says horror is contingent upon the monster and this fear, this art horror, he calls it, that is evoked in the positive character, the person in the story. And note, he can only talk about the people in the story because he can't do the, the hard science. He can't actually get the data like he can now today. So this entire thing just is really, it's tenuous. It's a tenuous kind of read on horror because it can only really talk about horror in one place, in one time in the genre. And it can only really talk about like the collective psyche of that time. Like I I think about like, okay, this book came out in the early nineties and we just got over the cold war. We've been like trying to root out communists over the last century. There have been huge, uh, you know, there, there's huge political unrest throughout the uh, throughout the 20th century. What you have, the rise of the religious right in the late 80s. So like there is definitely like this huge like hang up the country has about imp- impurity and thinking about this as sensitively as possible. But like you had the AIDS crisis, you know, AIDS epidemic, which probably wasn't, you know, was also some some amount of where, where this guy's head was. I have a hard time thinking it wasn't. So it's interesting to look at all of those data points in, in aggregate and kind of see, well, okay, cool. Like I can see where he's coming from and I can see where, where his thesis really holds up. But I question it because like this guy can't account for something like, I don't even think Wes Craven's new nightmare had come out by that time, much less something like Scream. This is where I think we really have to start asking questions. And, and to your point, Ashley, I think where I really, uh, why I love that you emphasized because I feel like it's, it's really, this is where asking these questions about horror is about to get exciting and over the next century because of data science. But like this evolutionary approach to narrative 
I actually, so earlier I mentioned that I was reading some aesthetics and, and one guy I came across is a guy named Dennis Dutton, who has a paper called Aesthetics and Evolutionary Psychology. And he essentially, you know, puts forward this idea. And Kevin, you mentioned this earlier about like kind of this being the truest genre that like the, that this like narrative kind of permeates. One of the things that Dennis Dutton puts forward in this, I think is really salient is uh, that like, we have to consider the fact that we just do language. Like by default, we just do language. We have an aptitude for syntax before we even like hear language. We just have an aptitude for that. And like his whole thing is perhaps, and there's some, some pretty good reason to ask the question, the entire capacity to create narrative is indeed a priori uh, before uh, we even come out of the womb. This is kind of like one of the things that we get handed down from the plasticine. So yeah, just a there's a lot of really cool research happening uh, in in this field as it relates to horror because I think the you know the reason we're all here is because we feel like we get something out of that and, and I think a lot of people are questioning like what exactly that is especially because there is such like actual horror in the world and it's not always self evident how or why horror helps us cope with that or if it does. You know, it's interesting you said that. I was reading an article. And I think it's about the same from the same fellow that you were talking about, Colton Scrivener. Yeah. They did an article about horror fans in relation to resilience during the pandemic. So how people responded to it and how they were able to cope with the pandemic up to this point. Obviously, there's still the pandemic going. But what they found is that fans of horror films exhibited greater resilience during the pandemic than fans that are not horror fanatics, especially fans that are in the prepper genres or what they consider the prepper genres. So like alien invasion, apocalyptic and zombie films, those specific sub genres, those fans displayed even a bigger, greater resilience and preparedness for the pandemic. And to your point, you know, there is some kind of coping mechanism, but also a mechanism that helps us prepare for the actual horror in the real world. And that horror may be present in, you know, whether it be presented in a pandemic form or whether it's something traumatic that occurs in our lives. But for some reason, horror allows us to develop coping mechanisms. And I mean, that's not saying hey, if you've got some problems, go watch horror films, you'll feel better, it's going to heal you. Um, because horror films can be triggering, depending on the trauma, and depending on what a person has been through. So wouldn't definitely recommend just go watching all the horror films to help yourself get resilience. But there is something there, right? There is something there that horror fans do display greater resilience than a non horror fan during things like a pandemic. And I wonder if that like ties into, um, you know, when, when you're faced with a situation that triggers that fight or flight mode, like your body is releasing all of these endorphins and dopamine and, and everything to like either fight or flight or be able to handle, handle the situation. And while you're in an environment that you physically and subconsciously know is safe, like a movie theater or your living room that you, you know, you're safe there, you're watching this horror movie but you're still being triggered to uh, release these endorphins and whatnot. I wonder if that ties into what you're saying about the, the creating of these coping mechanisms where it's, we're not necessarily, I don't want to say conditioning ourselves to embrace the fight or flight mode, but we're able to like take a step back to be able to uh, see the situation, see the, see the world and be able to move, move on that way. If that makes any sense. I think practice makes perfect. So we're able to put ourselves in these very unreal situations, depending on, you know, the horror genre movie that you're watching, viewing. We're able to live vicariously through the characters in those situations and play it out in our head. And we are playing out the scenarios, right? You can tell by people that talk back to movies. It's like, no, I wouldn't do that. No, go out the door. No, don't go in the woods. No, don't do that. I would go do this. You're playing it out. As you're watching it, you're actually identifying like even without realizing it, you're playing out what should they be doing next? How should they survive this? How will they survive this? And so it's automatically happening. Our brains and our bodies are conditioned to automatically assess, how do I survive this situation? We're living vicariously through these characters, living through these survival conditions. And I think that the more you do it, the more repeatedly that you watch these movies and do this, 
Mm-hmm. You are essentially preparing yourself for scenarios where you are in fight or flight. You're training yourself to be more observant. And you're also training yourself to pause and think in a situation that's high intensity and maybe keep yourself calm. There's a desensitization that happens. You know, the first time, what was it, when hostile was introduced into the market? That was one of the first mainstream, and I call it torture porn. But that was one of the first mainstream torture porn that like, you know, gore films that came into our mainstream film genre since Hellraiser. And Hellraiser was decades before that. So you've got decades from when we had seen torture by another human being. This was probably one of the first mainstream films. Because before that, it was what Hellraiser was demon. So we're still able to desensitize like that's not real because mm-hmm. there's no Cenobite world. But Eli Roth did something a little bit more sadistic because he made the torture come from a fellow human being. And he put it in a world that was supposed to be happy. Like, oh, these people are on vacations and they just got married and they're having fun with their friends. And now we're peeling off skin and eyeballs. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is awful. So I think he disturbed us on a level that we hadn't been introduced to yet on a mainstream capacity. And again, we're, we're playing through those survivals in these things. That, I think, carried with people a lot more than other genres, though. And so I will say that out of all the genres, I've noticed that that genre tends to have less of a cult following. Their cult following is pretty hardcore, but a less following than your monster genre or your you know, prepping genre, because it's almost a little too realistic. Yeah, I, it's, it's really interesting, because uh, we've really commodified, like most media, right? Like, most media exists as an artifact for consumption, uh, a commodity for consumption, not even really truly an artifact in any like meaningful sense. You watch Hostel 1, then you watch Hostel 2, because why would you watch Hostel 1? You've already burned through your sort of like, kicks on that on that one. And so um, it, it's really interesting because in considering the psychology of horror, there are almost like two different ways you have to consider the psychology. Because in one aspect, horror like hostile um, or this torture porn, is it's, it's very technical. At the end of the day, the, the, these are displays of technical mastery and wizardry. And like th- this, is, this is really what people go for. And even the, the way that these films are engineered with uh, um, survey groups and uh, we're going to uh, fiddle with just putting the jump scare, this thing right here in this timeline and make this edit just so. Uh, all of this rooted in hard psychology, by the way. Like all of these decisions rooted in hard research in terms of attention span, in terms of what demographics are going to pay attention to what color grading, all of this stuff gets researched. And so like it then makes you question when we watch horror, do we get the same thing out of different horror and what is truly actually doing the job of horror anymore? Because like, I don't know that I truly even call hostile horror as much as it is a technical film. And that's not a value judgment because I think that like, you know, people can get value out of that. And that I'm not really, it's not really here to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. To your point, I don't think it does the same psychological thing at all. And in fact, I think it gets into an aspect of horror where maybe I wonder how much of this technical horror, these, these technical ways of doing art um, have more to do with uh, us generally, generationally just being very desensitized to a lot of stimulation. I can scroll through anything. Why am I going to sit in front of the screen for two hours? And so that's an interesting aspect of the psychology, I think, to consider, too, because then it opens up the door for like, well, what what's doing the job of like horror as such, like horror when we think of horror properly? There are plenty of other horror films that are doing that job. But then there's other stuff like Black Mirror that's doing that job, you know, which I can honestly say that like. 2016, late 2015, when I started watching Black Mirror, truly had never had a media-induced existential crisis before uh, that time. And um, and I say that, like, it sounds funny because we use that. Everybody's having a fucking existential crisis. Sorry to swear. <laughs> no, we do swear all the time. Okay. Um, everybody's having an existential crisis right now. We bandy that term around a lot. But truly, I... The episode where uh, the young man goes and tests out the horror 
video game, the immersive horror video game, and essentially like gets caught in his like lifetime time warping like reality DMT of a trip of a death dream because he like took his cell phone in, like you know, like just like that thing, this idea that like, woo, this aspect of our technology is getting real close to our humanity and it's gonna interplay with our humanity in ways we cannot foresee. That to me is more horrifying than I think a lot of the things being uh, explored in, in areas of horror like Hostel, frankly. And I think if we can have a little fan worship uh, that like, you know, Wes Craven, really, I, I, I keep looking back at him because I'm like, I think he's he's somebody we maybe, I don't know if we've realized fully what his contribution was to horror. I had no idea he was a literature professor. I had no idea he was a literature professor. And so like the self-awareness he brings to horror, I feel like after you made a movie like Scream, you couldn't just like nobody could go and do those things again. You had to push it forward after that point. And I wonder to an extent, you know, when that happens, it's like you could say that horror had its moment where it became self-aware. And if it becomes self-aware, it's a force unto itself at this point. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I think of horror as maybe it might be its own alien life form among us, you know, and maybe we don't know that. <laughs> I think that Wes Craven has always spoken to the human condition, though, and he's done it through different avenues, whether it be a werewolf with, like, Cursed or Freddy Krueger or, you know, like you said, the self-awareness of Scream 2, 3, 4. It's not like he tried to find his category and just stuck with it. He has explored the many different subgenres within that genre, and I think there's something to be said about that. He has finessed comedy and horror which I think helps tell a story. I mean, Vampire in Brooklyn is hilarious, but there is still something menacing and unsettling about Vampire in Brooklyn. And the same with Scream, you know, it's funny, it's got its jokes, but again, there's something a bit alarming about that. And mm -hmm. Freddy, in a, you know, he was, I feel like Freddy was probably one of the first successful marriages of comedy and horror. And... Yet he still terrified people. He still, there were still lessons to be learned. I mean, come on. He was trying, in my opinion, to say the same thing we've kind of been discussing about oral tradition, right? Because you even have in Freddy Krueger the song that everybody knows, everybody hears. It, yeah. And it's like, it's a warning about something bad. Like you said, it's kind of like fan worship, but man, the, the finesse that Wes Craven has with horror and telling lessons through horror because within that within the 80s horror i think is where it was experiencing morals because that's what horror has always been up until that point the morals this is what happens if you do drugs if you have sex if you don't listen to your parents mm -hmm. because it's still very heavy-handed with morals or else you die if that reminds me of mean girls don't have sex <laughs> or else you'll get like genital herpes and die <laughs> His story just goes so deep, too. His, I, I can't remember the full title of the second Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, was that Dream Warriors? No, that wasn't Dream Warriors. Uh, Freddy's Revenge. Oh, thank you. But that was adopted by the LGBT community uh, because of the representation that it was having of the struggle and the turmoil of uh, coming out, especially during that oh. era. That movie has been seriously brought up just like Babadook in, in terms of uh, just representation of this internal feeling that some people are, are experiencing. Well, and you mentioned Dream Warriors. I mean, that was such a phenomenal change in, you know, we're used to seeing in horror films, the lead cast constantly being a certain type, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the type cast and the type, it's a very archetype. The archetypes are represented in, in Dream Warriors. I felt like that shifted to this idea of mental health, but also ableism because you had your character in the wheelchair and just understanding where people's weaknesses are and how they struggle individually and what each person idealized as what would make them a warrior, right? Because for him, it's like, man, I can walk, I could do this. That would make me, you know, a superhero. You see it in the superhero genre where kids are like, man, if I had this superpower, I'd be a superhero. So seeing that in part three Dream Warriors, I think there's a reason that that one did very well as well. Because the horror genre, again, it's exploring things and commenting in a way that other genres can't do. 
they have more of a playing field. It's almost like Dream Warriors is speaking on behalf of um, people's internal struggles and trying to overcome it. And like, but like you just said, you know, trying to figure out what makes you a warrior to get through and and fight your your demons when when you go to bed at night. Well, the fact that they all realize they're not alone, right? They had each other, and it's like yay teamwork, and they helped yeah. each other. I just thought it was a phenomenal film, and. Um, we're getting off track. Psychology of war. <laughs> no worries. So, okay, here's a, here's a scene that I want to ask you all about because I think that this is this is a really interesting question when I think about the ways that horror engages our psychology. Like, um, all right, there's the interview scene uh, in New Nightmare uh, where uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm committing sacrilege on air. I apologize. I can't remember the the. Uh, main character's name i'm always i'm terrible with these you're talking about things. heather heather yes yeah, heather, heather. Leggin camp yeah. yeah 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 yes yeah so heather's being interviewed uh robert england uh you know does his freddy thing and it's all fun and games and then like pan and you just see like all the kids dressed up as freddy uh and this i think is one of the most interesting scenes to me because uh the the way that wes craven poses this question about how does this thing turn into family fun? What is the that disnification of the monster? Like that that's a question that I actually I think is really interesting to think about with all of this because like when I see um uh like Funko Pop toys of uh um you know uh, Leatherface or yeah and like w- what is what is with the cutification of this? Um, you know, we used to abhor these things and now, uh, we identify with them in a way. What is that precisely? Is that a good thing? I I don't know. What, what do y'all make of that? I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Identifying with a villain is I think one of the things people are afraid of the most. Sure. And I think that when a story can have you relate to or identify with a villain or a monster or anything like that, that really unnerves people. But I think that's when it becomes like a masterpiece, when you can have a person completely shift perspective and empathize. Because a lot of what I've read on like the horror genre and the psychology of horror genre is that typically the horror fan has less empathy than a person who is not a horror fan. People who don't like horror tend to be way too empathetic. So they don't like people being hurt. They don't like to see that. It's too much for them. So the typical horror fan is able to swallow that or not feel that and it's not as alarming. Now, I'm not saying that's, you know, every horror fan, but that's something that Mm -hmm. they've researched and kind of been finding. So for me, if you can get a horror fan who is supposedly not as empathetic to empathize with not only the characters that should be empathized with, but also the one that maybe should be empathized with even more, Mm -hmm. then it's like, holy cow, that is that is a masterpiece. Now, I think there's a difference between empathizing and idolizing so if i idolize what you know leatherface did that's a problem (laughs) i shouldn't want to go take people's you know skin off and wear them as my face but if i can empathize with him and feel some kind of like oh what happened to you that you're now doing this that is awful like wow that's a story right and that i think is At the base of it, I think horror does, like I said, what other genres can't do. It not only causes us to step back and look at scenarios and look at different outcomes of scenarios. Like we're little Dr. Stranges here. And it's like, okay, there's 15 million options and this is the one that will lead you to survival. Um, The horror genre also allows us to do something other genres can't do which is to empathize with characters that do not necessarily immediately reflect us. Why is it on Rotten Tomatoes, Us is number one movie. Get Out is number two movie. That's a big deal, right? Because you can't tell me that 100% of horror fans are Black, right? Mm -hmm. We have a pretty diverse genre, which I love. But 
for that movie to be that high, it spoke to people and they were able to empathize in a plight that maybe they couldn't put themselves in before. And watching other genres, whether it be a romantic comedy or drama or action, they're not going to necessarily identify and put themselves in that same position as those characters. But with horror, we all do. We all put ourselves in the position of the main character because it is a fight or flight situation. And I think that's awesome because it's able to do that. Yeah. Empathizing uh, with a character that we normally wouldn't. I think Rob Zombie did a really good job with Michael Myers with his remake, trying to get us in there, seeing when he was younger, all the stuff that happened to him. Maybe that's why he is the way that he is. And I definitely, and we had talked about it before a little bit. I was kind of rooting for the guy. Let's go. Let's go get all these <laughs> motherfuckers. You know, let's go. So I think Rob Zombie did a really good job just touching on that subject. Yeah, I think that identifying with the shadow can can definitely be a really healthy thing. And uh, and it's interesting uh, because I think Us is a really good example uh, in, in that sense. Um, because, like, what are the odds we're ever going to get a Funko Pop toy of Us? <laughs> like, and, 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 but that's a really important thing. What is that horror? That horror registers somewhere on the, like, this is actually too frightening and we have to respect it. Versus like this other horror that we can sort of like objectify and then flatten out and then we can make it cute. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and break it to you. There actually are fun. Yeah, pop I was about to send you a link. <laughs> this, see, then, th- see, that makes me then that makes me actually wonder, are people truly identifying with the shadow then? Are they just fooling themselves? You know, like it, it's, it's an interesting thing um, because I think. To make something like that, it, to render something like that in such a cute fashion, what is that impulse? I don't think they have to actually be dependent on one another because I think that you have Funko who realize that horror fans love to collect. They love to collect anything that meant something to them. And so whether mm. it's a Funko Pop or an action figure or a poster or a set item, uh. like that industry, horror conventions make more money than most other conventions because horror fans will spend the money to go and buy any and all horror memorabilia, meet their horror icons. Like if you go to any of the Comic-Cons, Robert England will have three times the waiting line than a sci-fi person or an A-list person. Like I have seen his lines wrap around as much as Stan Lee's as Clark Gregg's because like he made that big of an impact. And so I think that you just have a few companies that have realized that is what the horror fan is about. And so they try to monetize on it and horror fans are like, well, I love that movie. It meant so much to me. It connected to me. It sits with me. I'll collect anything from it. So they Google it. They see the Funko pop. Those are also easy to get at conventions and get celebrities to sign. So they're like, well, Uh, okay, I'll buy a $10 Funko pop versus a $30 poster and get the celebrity to sign the top of the box. They sign their character. Yes. I see. <laughs> I mean, that, that actually makes sense to me then, because I can see where this performs the same, um, maybe the same function as uh, I have saint icons. Um, and so now these things sort of insert themselves into my psyche every day. And it's like, a, okay, like, that's the virtue that I'm actually like, trying to cultivate in my life. So I could definitely see how like, maybe uh, like, uh, um, Leatherface is, uh, you know, does stand in for um, the virtue of uh, resilience uh, in the sense that like I was terrified of uh, the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when, when I was uh, a kid, it was like one of the first horror movies I saw. It was, it was like seven and um, the cannibalism taboo just totally got me. It like totally disgusted me and I could not, I could not watch it. Um, I probably didn't finish that movie until I was somewhere in my mid teens. So yeah, I could definitely see how, that maybe brings something a little different to somebody's life. Yeah. I have a um, Funko Pop of Ghostface that I had Skeet Ulrich actually sign. And hopefully one of these days get the other killers from Scream to, to do the same. Or maybe <laughs> Nev, but yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> That's cool. And like you said, I don't think it's loving the icon themselves all the time. I think that it's a representation of what that movie meant. Right. 
you're not necessarily going to find the characters that maybe you did identify with, or maybe it wasn't a character you identified with, but the entire storyline. And then there is sometimes there is stuff that, you know, and I'd like to dive into this a little because I think we do understand horror when it comes to fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of horror is talking to our fight or flight survival instinct. But let's talk about what's with the appeal of horror in an erotic sense. And I'm not saying let's go get dirty, but there are people that really dig Hellraiser. They love Pinhead and they have an attraction to Pinhead. There are people that find the genre and not the entire genre, but certain films within the genre or certain subgenres within the genre exciting in a different way. Like it, it speaks to a different part of them. So what do we have for that? I don't know. It, it's, it's weird because like, I'm always conflicted when I think about human sexuality because like it seems like it's simultaneously the easiest thing about us and the weirdest thing about us. Like it's the easiest thing to understand because it's just like unfettered appetite. Like that's that's essentially what it is. Appetite for the sake of perpetuating the species. If you if you get like real cynical and real like far end like okay, we're just going to treat humans like animals. But then like you can get into a lot of conjecture about whether or not that has anything to do with early childhood trauma. You can get into a lot of conjecture about uh, the degree to which people's sexuality is influenced by genetics or, or anything else, which is like really unclear and really messy territory to get into. It's a tough question to ask because I think, um, I don't know. I have my own thoughts on it. I guess what I think about it is um, we're shown ways to be and, um, you know, we, we have optionality in, in our in our life ways. And I think we all get exposed to a lot of different imagery in our lives and that can that can affect us in different ways. But I don't know. I don't I I mean, if we just look at it from a technical perspective, it's not so obvious when pain and pleasure are necessarily like separate, you know, in terms of like what's happening to us chemically. Um, as far as the erotic goes, you know, I mean, <sighs> George Bataille would say that like eroticism has a categorical violation component to it. I think that's his thing on eroticism is that there is a categorical violation component to it. So if take Noel Carroll's premise on the monster that, you know, there, there's this aspect of categorical violation. And if we take the premise of George Bataille in, in eroticism, that there's a categorical violation aspect in that, this idea that for a moment, you know, if we take the point of climax and look at that as a, as a categorical transgression of maybe uh androgyny i don't know um any number of things um maybe even just transcending the individual maybe it's less weird to me that people find horror erotic i don't know what's interesting is you said pain you know is similar to pleasure but they're different yes and no because the same chemical receptors that you find in pleasure can also be found in the pain response. In the pain response, you also get an adrenaline reaction. So you're getting adrenaline and pleasure chemicals, maybe not at the same extent as you would just straight pleasure receptors, but it's like it's, it's there. So they are kind of coming from a similar space. And, you know, with the horror genre, I think especially when you talk about films like Hellraiser, the Hellraiser series, I think those are very evocative of the BDS, BDSM, mm -hmm. you know, community. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that everybody in the BDSM community has some kind of childhood trauma and that's why they are stimulated by pain. Right. I think that um, there is a BDSM quality to those films. Like we can all say Hellraiser is the BDSM world that they've then exaggerated and added on to with monsters and other things. But that doesn't negate that Pinhead represents some powerful sexuality in and of itself as a figure. And then you look at Silent Hill and you see characters like, what is that dude's name? The Triangle Dude. Um, Pyramid, Head. Pyramid Head. Pyramid Head. Pyramid Head. Pyramid Head is very similar in nature to Pinhead in terms of what he represents. So in that same, like, exuding that primitive, aggressive, and at its base... Trauma aside, because yes, I think some people's responses to horror may be rooted in, you know, trauma, but that aside, I think a lot of it also comes from a primitive nature within our sexuality and aggression and assertion 
that's kind of built into our DNA as well. And that speaks to us. And so some people do have those responses when they see those archetypes and those characters that represent this dominance or exuding this kind of primitive nature that it's like, oh, hey. The other thing that's interesting about Hellraiser too, and I think this also plays into human sexuality, is the aspect of curiosity. Um, we have such sights to show you. Like, I mean, that's like, and the whole thing that calls is the is the curious nature, not necessarily uh, like the intent. It's it's you know it's it's the curious nature that that sort of calls, and that's really interesting. Just looking at it through like a, I think when when you. Uh, when you look at it through like Catholic theology, what's really interesting is that like curiosity is actually described as a sin and is precisely for that reason, because you have a curiosity about what a pleasure could be before you actually seek it out. So it, it's interesting because um, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I hadn't really considered the, the question of sexuality in, in horror. But as, as, as we talk through it more, I think uh, it's definitely it's easier for me to see uh, than not. The horror genre is so vast, right, mm -hmm. than any other genre. Because even sci-fi kind of has its rules. You know, rom-coms have their rules and dramas have their rules that they have to abide by. And with horror, it's like we have no fucking rule book. It is just like you imagine it. The only rule is that you're trying to disturb somebody in some way, whether it be psychologically, emotionally, physically. You are trying to teach a lesson using negative characters, right? So it's just like, okay, that's kind of really the only rule. And maybe it's effective. Maybe it lands and hits the mark and you leave the theater scared or questioning yourself. But other than that, there are no rules. Because we found there that originally it was happy endings, right? And I don't mean we're talking about sexuality. I don't mean those <laughs> kinds. But I mean the kinds where every story had to end with the moral of the story and a happy ending, right? Somebody survived. But then we noticed a shift in like the 2000s where that wasn't happening and it ended where the villain wins or the monster wins or whatever, but the hero doesn't win. And it's like, ah, oh, shit. People leave just watching something feeling just destroyed because we're, again, we're coming from a fight or flight and a survivor kind of thing, right? With survival. And so when it's like, man, nobody got out of that alive, you're still in there with them. So it's like, oh, I died. There was no way out. And it's just like, it, it's a mind fuck because it's like the hero couldn't win and the hero didn't win. Oh, oh no. Holy cow, the horror world allows us to explore so many things. Our internal monsters, the external monsters, things we don't even realize we're afraid of. But also not just the monster. You know, like you said, curiosity, uh, sexuality, and so many other things. But also just kind of wrapping up the Hellraiser thing. You know, I feel like the series in and of itself also kind of evolved because the Hellraiser world did something where they created rules for their world that the Cenobites and Pinhead had to live by. So like Hellraiser 1, I felt like was a traditional horror film reminiscent of back in the 80s where it's like moral of the story, only bad people open the box and they'll be punished. They go to hell. Hellraiser 2 kind of spun it on the head because they separated Pinhead from his human soul counterpart. And then it was like all hell on earth. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad, you're all dying. But mm -hmm. then you started kind of veering off even further and it was like oh well good people open the box if you're coerced into opening the box so you didn't do it on free will you won't be punished you won't be taken mm -hmm. so they're still kind of establishing these boundaries i still think they're like moral of the story lessons you know like good people don't get punished kind of like friday the 13th you know good little campers that don't have sex don't get murdered by jason but then he just started killing everybody so it's like well i might as well have sex because we're all gonna die anyways anyways vast world lots of exploration <laughs> ashley's a windbag i do like that aspect about horror though it's not always the happy ending like you said like i don't know if <laughs> sorry now now i can't not hear that anymore. yeah <laughs> all right but... <laughs> Are you guys familiar with uh, Michael Haneke, the um, European director? No. So uh, he uh, he made a film in 1990, uh, 1997 called Funny Games. And he actually, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
And he mm. actually remade Funny Games in 2007, uh, shot for shot. His style of filmmaking is so bizarre because it's he doesn't really he doesn't believe in non-diegetic music. So everything you hear happens within the scene. And like if there's music, it's coming from a radio. There's no overtone. There's no you know background music. There's no and nothing of that sort. And he also really doesn't edit like he doesn't cut between camera angles like he goes from a fly on the wall approach and i remember i'm not going to give any spoilers by any means but there's this one shot uh kind of around the climax of the film that lingers for about seven to nine minutes and it does not move it's completely static and it is one of the most gut-wrenching shots i have ever seen it's visually it's not not the most stunning thing in the world because like technically but the amount of emotion that he captures through the scene i remember watching it the first time and i couldn't watch the whole shot like because i was i went from feeling angry to sad to like incredibly depressed back to like just furious about what was happening in the scene and like that small shot in the film was such an emotional roller coaster and i thought it was just absolutely beautiful and i like the movie is is horrible in the sense of like what happens but it is a true in my opinion a masterpiece of of horror this is a like really really interesting ground to talk about because uh like funny games i hadn't even considered that uh movie uh, until like Holy cow! I haven't thought of that movie since the the remake with uh, what Michael Pitt. Uh, 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 yeah, and um, yeah, Naomi Watts. Yeah, I, that came out, and it was like, like, yeah, I saw that version. I didn't see the original, but I, I I'm I'm totally with you on that. And other films in that vein, or another director uh, who evokes, I think, similar things, is uh, Lars von Trier and Ari Aster, who are like. I think these are th- these are people who who I like when I say like what's doing the job of horror that like these scary movies used to do because like you know for a long time all of the classics that we talk about like that like those weren't classics that was just the thing happening and so like we see it in a different light from where we're standing it is almost like like the same way that punk rock is fun family entertainment where like it actually used to be dangerous <laughs> Um, you know, and that's not like a oh, posers. It's just, this, this is what happens in the media landscape. Um, these directors are interesting to me because it's like, it, it doesn't, it, it like, yeah, it's, it's just a whole, I think about the scene in hereditary Tony Collette scene in hereditary is, is like a, a scene like that for me. where just like the stillness of the thing is actually the thing we're so used to having our emotions spoon fed to us that it's actually the stillness of the thing that's we're more uneasy with, uh, which I find interesting. One of the films that really stuck with me and I felt was just a beautiful, well done film. I recommend this to everybody, a quiet place because you had to watch that movie completely in silence. And this idea that there isn't everything to distract you and people are leaning in because we're so used to being auditory with everything else. Like you said, spoon fed, everything spoon fed to us. And we don't get that. We don't get the dialogue really. We have to watch their faces. So we are intently soaking them in and we're building their relationships and the entire storyline through body language and a little bit of dialogue, but not much. And no music or sounds to really guide us through that, right? Mm-hmm. It's. I think that was just, it was artistic and beautiful because it stripped back so many elements we are used to being handed to us. And it put us in a monster world. And for me, I'm pretty desensitized to the monsters. So they don't really scare me. I'm not, you know, oh, jump scene. And But A Quiet Place, I was just like, oh, I was torn apart with that movie. And I'm not going to give spoilers away. If you haven't seen it by now, poo-poo on you, go watch it. But I'll still be kind to not give spoilers away. And just heart-wrenching, just destroyed my emotions that day. I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to see it because I haven't seen it yet. Poo-poo on you. Poo-poo on you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I poo-poo on her. Poo-poo on her. <laughs> uh, Jordan Peele with uh, us. and um, Get out. Get out. Thank you. I mean, I've always felt that comedy and horror are very similar. 
in the sense of it's all about timing, it's all about rhythm, it's all about plants and getting to the payoff at the right moment and the release and the time to breathe before you go into your next joke or your next scare. And like, I feel like that's why John Krasinski and Jordan Peele did such an amazing job with like A Quiet Place and Get Out and Us is just their sense of timing and their sense of story and their sense of, of just rhythm. And I think horror especially relies so much on that rhythm. I think a good horror film or a solid horror film, no matter what the storyline is, one that is effective is one that has a lyrical rhythm to it. Like you said, the moments between the intensity and the moment of relief and the pause. And I think that's why the movies that end without that happiness are the hardest because we're carried through that last scene. We're in that fight or flight moment and we never get that release. We never get that moment where the pause, because usually in fight or flight in real life, like not in a movie, we get our fight or flight. And then afterwards we get that relief, that positive feelings that gets released after. And so fear floods our brains and then it's followed with the feel good chemicals. Right. And so with those movies that don't end happy, those wreck us because we're waiting for that relief and we don't get it. And how do you give that to yourself? Right. Because we were living through somebody else's story. So it's not like you can like, Oh, I'm going to rewrite it in my head and (laughs) change the ending differently. Like it doesn't work that way. And so that's what we're left with when it's not our story. With that said, we're talking about horror and the psychology of horror from an audience perspective. What do you think it takes psychologically to be the artist that writes horror, that creates horror? horror visually because that's a different kind of person too like you said comedy is different not every person can write comedy and not every person can write horror i actually i feel like my expectation of most horror like writers and or maybe not writers because writers as like a group are just weird people yeah tend, we're fucked tend up. To be, <laughs> <laughs> that tend to be like uh, but but like at least horror film directors i kind of expect them to be like pretty normal people it seems like it anyway like i don't know i i feel like if that's the imagery in your head like most of the time and you're not acting on it like you got to have your stuff pretty together like you found something to channel that into And then I just wonder, like, how much of it is really, like, anomalous? Like, I don't know. It's really weird. I'm speaking, I guess, so if we're talking about horror cross mediums, you know, I'm speaking about all of the uh, metal bands that I've played with and, uh, you know, (laughs) met. And they're mostly huge teddy bears. (laughs) Why do you think that is? I don't know. Maybe, Maybe it is that shadow integration, you know? It's interesting because the article that you cited earlier from uh, Colton Scribner, what's interesting about what he puts forward in that is uh, this idea that um, he predicates anxiety on this la- this perceived lack of control that induces anxiety, um, which I think is pretty solid. Who am I to say anyway? I'm a lay person. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, like, I, yeah, sounds good. All right, so let's take that. If that's the case, I think these big guys usually are very aware that in many situations, they're in control of the situation <laughs> uh, just by virtue of their size and options for whatever they may encounter. Uh, so it, there's probably a different psychology at work there, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a big guy, so it's not actually hard for me to think about inhabit a frame that's like six foot four and like 200 pounds because i I imagine you have your own anxieties (laughs) you know that don't entail getting uh swirly you know at face value people probably think that to be capable of writing horror or creating visual horror whether it be through art or direction you know directing that there's got to be some kind of mental imbalance and That's for people who don't understand. (laughs) Yeah. I have found that the horror genre for a lot of writers that I've talked to is very cathartic. There are demons that they're willing to address within themselves that they don't suppress. They don't push down. They don't swallow Mm -hmm. it down. They don't ignore and pretend it doesn't exist. They address it front on 
put it into their characters, put it into their storylines, almost like a literary exorcism, and then put it out into the world. And I think that you can find that through literary horror, you know, like you said, cross mediums. I think that the horror artist has a very unique opportunity to play out their own internal issues, if you will, that maybe isn't as accessible through other genres. And you can layer it, you can hide it, if you will, subtly into other characters, into stories. You can use symbolism and metaphor. So I could take addiction, but put it into this horror story as something completely different and work Mm -hmm. through that. But it also doesn't have to be my internal monster. It can be my trauma. It could be someone else's trauma. It can be something else that I am dealing with that I put into a storyline and change it into something else because horror provides that canvas, right? And that ability to manipulate the world into representing something else. So maybe my dragon is a butterfly or my demon is a pizza delivery guy. I don't know, but it's just... (laughs) It, I think it's it's cathartic. It's a catharsis that a lot of other genres maybe aren't able to, I guess, access. Definitely. I mean, it doesn't have to be cerebral, I guess, is maybe the way it wins, is that horror doesn't, it just doesn't have to be cerebral to work. And, and that's a good thing. Like, that's not a knock on it. That's a really good thing. Um, yeah, I think the only reason I think horror writers are weird is because H.P. Lovecraft. So he's probably tainted my image of horror writers, for, <laughs> which is, you know, a bummer because I, him and Edgar Allan Poe, they're both really morose people. You think about our contemporary authors and horror creators, and they're not all created equal. Look, there are opportunists out there who know that. The horror genre, you know, is making anywhere up from 12 billion over the past decade. And that's just a money market. And they're like, all right, let's what scares them. And they figure out, like you said, they figure out that formula. It's very like a commodity that they are supplying. And so it's they figured out that formula. They're very technical about it. They know what people are going in for. They're speaking to that fight or flight and they're speaking to the biological aspect of horror and they have figured that out. And hey, you know what? Kudos to them. It's just a different way of approaching the art. But then there are those I think that are just coming from it in a completely artistic form in terms of this is my story. This is how I get it out. This is a story I have to tell. And this is the art I have to put into the world in whatever medium that may be in that genre. And you can tell, like, you know, you watch a movie and you can tell when the storyline is the forefront and when it's the afterthought. Yeah, definitely. I'm a huge fan of giallo films, so know that feeling. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, so here's a question then, like, what do you make of things like, um, embodied horror or sort of like the horror experience, uh, by way of VR? Um, because this is another aspect of horror that I think, you know, when we start talking about, um, how we engage with it, um, this is new and it's like really, it's a different thing because, so one of the interesting things about, um, Noel, Carol's idea of art horror is that it's predicated on the fact that there's a gap between your experience and the character's experience. But that gap has to be there or else you would just be horrified and you'd run screaming out of the theater. So what do you make of the fact that we're attempting to close this gap? My thought on it is it, it tends to be more about the sort of emotional experience maybe just the fact that like we're past the point that even movies scare us and now we need this and it's just the harder drug or is it maybe uh this idea of um actually being able to overcome a thing because you're in the experience and and you can actually be the one to get that closure that we don't get in in another movie where we're not sure if everybody died or what um no no what do y'all make of that I put that in line with the haunted house. Uh, Okay. I think it's more like the thrill junkie aspect of it. And I also think it's to your point. It also touches on kind of like, I don't know if it's the harder hit because we're desensitized, but I do think the harder the scare, the more intense relief and feel good chemicals you feel. And so I think people maybe aren't desensitized, but I think they get a different kind of fear. 
it's more real and more intense when they're put in a haunted house or they're put in a VR. And so I think it's just, I think it's more of a haunted house kind of thing. And it's more of like a thrill chaser, like, you know, looking for that harder intensity of emotional swings, that pendulum of intense high and intense low. And we see that with love. People that love to fall in love, but it's their feet, they're chasing that intensity, that emotion. I know I'm touching on a different subject, but it's very similar. And, you know, we no, talk yeah, about pain and pleasure, same with love and fear. Love evokes that intense, you know, emotional roller coaster. And I think that, you know, horror is doing the same thing. It's tapping into that intense emotional roller coaster that people kind of like to be on sometimes. Mm-hmm. I do not like haunted houses and I will not touch a horror VR for the record. That's a nope. (laughs) Yeah. I, I agree with you, Ash. I feel like most of them or most of the VRs are, are more of like a thrill for entertainment, like a haunted house. Um, I think there are some that kind of tap in depending on like what the the story is of the VR and, and how it was written. I think some of them can fall in the category of like what we're talking about with horror and uh, experience things that work through things and, and have um, personal and mental impact or uh, emotional impacts through, through the story. But I also feel like they're definitely heavily relying on the, the thrill aspect of, of a haunted house and kind of, throwing yourself into into the mix like you're living the horror film yeah i mean it's why something like resident evil is like occupies such like heavy space in my mind because my primary domain of horror growing up was the zombie movie which uh i think i caught the wave that a lot of people did probably largely because of resident evil i mean looking back on that experience for me and looking back on like what was sort of interesting uh to me in that you know it's a it's interesting to reflect on as i was playing that game i would have these uh these dreams that i was in the game and uh they were nightmares until i beat the game and then it was just like then for like months after i just had dreams where i was just killing zombies and then for like years after that I would just have dreams where I'd be doing a thing. Maybe we'd be having this conversation and, uh, you know, or maybe you you come over to my house, we're having a conversation on the couch and I offer you a drink and I say, oh, uh, just watch out for the zombie over there. It's like a plant in the corner. It's, It's just a zombie there, not even really a threat. It's just in the landscape. These things are like in my mental landscape now. To me, as somebody who experienced survival horror as like a emergent genre in gaming and to look at, at the landscape now and to see that there seems to be a different appeal um, just because of the technology. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting for me to think about it uh, through that lens. But yeah, I think your, your comparison to uh, the thrill seeking of, of the Haunted House is apt. That makes sense. It's actually funny. I was just playing Resident Evil 2 earlier today and uh so yeah that's the one yep that's yep. the one scared the shit out Hooked of me, me then still did but yeah um going back to the whole like other video games like left for dead that one was yeah. not scary but that was a fun game i love that game so uh, fun the uh the, the witches in the game you know how they're crouched down and you, you don't see them until Terrifying. i'd be driving home from work at night and see just this like dimly lit little whatever it is like a little pole or whatever and i'm like holy shit that's a witch right there like what the hell i gotta be quiet and yeah, yeah. so it was yeah, like yeah. the game fucked me up <laughs> a little bit but yeah played it a little too much that's a that's an interesting one to talk about uh through the psychological lens because it totally changed the model for that kind of game playing like it was a collaborative game like this aspect of like the zombie movie which is always one of the more int- it's always the most interesting aspect is like the group and the group dynamic and how will the group get through this like you're actually in control of that and you know, like you play that out in a real way and that's kind of what made that such an interesting experience I, at least for me I, I don't know if, if you felt the same way but I definitely loved kind of organizing that and, and partaking in that. Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, I used to play with John and John, your daughter, all the time. <laughs> that was awesome. It's cool. Yeah, that was fun, yeah. especially when the mics didn't work and Kevin didn't know how to play. That was fun. We're like, Kevin, I had to call him. I'm like, dude, get the uh, fuck over here, go over there. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet facing off tanks was uh, terrible. 
you'd see Kevin hanging off a building, but like, oh shit, I gotta go save him. Hold on, here we go. Yeah, that that I think it, what what's interesting to me too in that aspect is considering like the way in which horror maybe is uh, accessed, not even just in in those video games, but even you know I brought up Jalo earlier, and I was talking to a friend about this about how so many of the effects in um, horror half of the horror sometimes can be in just the uncanny uh, aspect of the uh, of of the effects. Um, uncanny Valley, if you don't know it, is this idea that you can sort of model uh, how close something is to human by an inverse bell curve. So like there's a point where a thing just isn't human, but it doesn't bug us. We don't actually, it doesn't actually elicit a, a, a reaction of disgust because we know it's not human. So big deal. Um, and then you kind of get this like really steep bell curve where like the closer we get to human, the worse our negative reaction is until it's indistinguishable from human. And so this concept grows out of a, a concept forwarded by Freud, which is the uh, concept of the uncanny. Basically, he's explaining what is this emotional state that we're actually feeling. And it's a violation of the familiar. It's actually the, the fact that we know this thing, it's familiar, but by virtue of context or by virtue of something, it's been rendered unfamiliar. So we've returned home but it's not home. It's the antithesis of home, even though we're here, which I think is a, is a really interesting uh, feeling to, to kind of look at horror through the lens of, because uh, I think like, I think of a lot of uh, horror that has to do with dolls. This one, this one's interesting because like dolls, doll horror, like what is it about that image that is unsettling to us? Dolls, man, like that uncanny thing really can't be understated. I don't know. What what do y'all make of that? I throw that out there <laughs> as a question. I mean, there's obviously a fear of them. You've got Annabelle, you've got Dear Dolly, you've got like their Dolly Dearest, whatever it was. It's like, obviously the, you know, something in dolls, like you said, it's the uncanny. The, they're too reminiscent maybe of people that it freaks people out that they could come to life because they look like us close enough, I guess. But For me, they've never, at least personally for me, I've never been really freaked out by dolls. Wax figures? They don't bug me. Wow. Clowns also don't bug me either. And like zombies get me. Zombies? Zombies (laughs) fuck with me. But like, I can watch the movies and be fine and think like, wow, that was amazing. That was a great storyline. Great social commentary. Like Romero, social commentary on human and humans and society. Like, yeah. But then I have awful nightmares and I wake up screaming and punching the air. And I'm like, okay, you got to me on a subconscious level that I didn't realize. So yeah, zombies just mm -mm, don't sit well with me. You know, I think there's so many elements and threads of that, though, that you're talking about. Like you hit something so big about this idea that people are disturbed by things that are almost human, but not quite human, because it freaks us out to see the monster within us. We are capable of being that monster. It's creepy. Seeing that we are that monster really messes with people. So dolls, I think, are reminiscent of that because they look Mm -hmm. like people. You know, you have a killer teddy bear. It's probably not going to be as effective as a killer porcelain doll or a doll that looks like Annabelle or you know what I mean it has to be very much similar to how we as people look and I also think that's why possession films freak out people this idea that we we have no longer control over ourselves there's a monster inside of us we are the monster and there's nothing we can do about it Mm. because I don't think people are scared of and I could be you know making a big assumption here but I'm not sure when you ask people why possession films freak them out I don't think the fear is I'm afraid I'm going to come across someone who's possessed and they're going to kill me it's more so I'm afraid of being possessed and a demon taking over my body so that loss of control over the self and not having control over the self I think is very terrifying to people and to see that dolls are capable of that. I don't think people are scared of dolls. I think it's what those dolls represent, that the human is the monster. So, mm, Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it definitely goes either way, because I think that 
That makes sense. It's an interesting thing to me, mostly because like, I think maybe the reason I want to push back on the fact that like the category violation is the horrifying thing is because like, there's also this aspect of collectively, psychologically us embracing things that do transgress category in the, in the sense that like, maybe the categories are bad ones, <laughs> just frankly, like maybe these are just bad categories and we shouldn't be using them. The category violations, like do they change? You know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to think about so much modern horror with what has been said of horror previously because we're revealing so much to ourselves right now um, just about even like how horrible we can actually be. I think it's hard to I think it's hard to define horror in general. Like I think it is not meant to be defined. I think as people, as humans, we love to categorize def- and define and put rules and boundaries and labels on. And I think that's why I love the horror genre so much is you cannot do it because it umbrellas and covers so much. You absolutely just cannot define. You see it even with the horror community and films. We can't even agree on certain films. Is this horror or is this not horror? Like Gremlins, a lot of people don't consider Gremlins a horror film. A lot of people do. It's like, Mm -hmm. even within the horror community, we can't even agree on what's horror Mm -hmm. because it's such a vast world. And I mean, I've read scripts, like even Kevin and I read scripts where we're like, is this, it was submitted as horror, but I don't know. I'm not sure if maybe it's this genre, but that person, that screenwriter who the story came from, they feel it's horror. They identify it as horror. So horror is so subjective on even what we consider horror because there aren't rules, there aren't boundaries. And I really like that. I like that it not cannot be wrapped up and contained in a box. That what is horror to one person is not horror to another because it's our human experience, right? It's our human experience to perceive things and to determine how we perceive them. And I love that horror really calls that out as well. You know, after this discussion, I tend, I definitely see the unique problems posed by analyzing horror media or horror in media. And it gives me far more appreciation for what Noel Carroll did with his book in the philosophy of horror, because it's definitely, this is really a a tough thing to nail down. Mm -hmm. The psychology of horror thing's really tough. You probably have to take it movie by movie. No, I agree. I agree completely. Like a lot of these films, you can't, because it's such a vast genre with no boundaries and no rules, in my opinion, it is really hard to break down just one psychology of, but I think that's any genre. People are complex human beings. So why wouldn't the psychology behind it also be complex with many layers and many surfaces? But I love this conversation this evening. You guys are amazing. And I'm so glad that you came on, Johnny. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. It was an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed this one. Like It was deep. And if I can quote Eleanor Roosevelt really quick, uh, every day, do something out of your normal, do every do you something that scares you? And if I can be a smart ass, I'm going to quote Randy from Scream. There's always some bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Don't kill anybody. <laughs> Scream is my favorite movie. I love Scream. So I had to throw that in there. Well, thank you again, Johnny, for coming on. Seriously, it was great. I had a blast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. This is great. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into 300 Podcast with your co-host. I'm John Thomas. And I'm Kevin K. Daddy. And I'm Ashley Lunar Goddess. Have any questions, comments, or concerns? I always throw the concerns in there just in case. Email us at 300podcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to follow us on our social media. You don't want to miss one crazy moment.